an outlaw joker paraded down the streets, a cornucopia of color pervading the expanse of the carnival grounds. Illuminated by the gypsy effervescence of timeless recreation and pursuit of pleasure, the synapses of human traffic were unrivaled by the general sense of calm surrender to joviality that was not common to the human overlay world. Surrounded on both sides by his trusted companions, one with hair jet black as night, and to his right a woman of fair complexion, a fairy vampire girl who didn't talk much but was always cheery and smiling, they entered town to find a display of congregated participants and closing on a black wall. To the right of the black wall, in a small wooden stall, four cheery and brightly smiling women with various degrees of hair color waved and cheered. But as the Joker looked on, they began to beckon. Come closer, they gestured. Grinning now, not about to succumb to such a gesture, a notable friend appeared amongst the brood and spread his arms wide, his long gray hair and beard emanating a warmth and genteel elegance, with just a note of comedic resignation. Hey guys, the Joker has entered the building! A few hands nearby clapped, and the women began to fake play swoon, but the Joker did not mind. His presence was not the assumption of this event, for even now, a current in the dark force was drawing some sort of crowd over to the black wall. A sort of urgency mixed in with patient waiting and expectance of some kind of arrival of power. <laughs> Grabbing his arm, his friend assured him that this was for sure the way to go. And calmly walking, they somehow found themselves in a fairly rigid formation. And without flare, a cascade of a hundred or more colored balloons entered the air, swirling toward the ceiling of the black wall exhibit. Chaotically buzzing together now, the static electricity was palpable enough that the hairs along the Joker's neck stood on end. And a faint surge of power entered the outdoor auditorium. And a small twinge of excitement also. Spinning together, the balloons created a cascade of dark symphony. Their combined power enough to open a portal, a vortex into the infinite void. As they formed a singularity engine, a black hole tear space in reality above. All around, the crowd began to clap. This was an accomplishment, for sure, but the Joker focused his concentration upon the black orbit, and the strings of the blooms arranged into a grid and began faint line glowing green threads of power, entangling into an overlay that encompassed his entire form. And out of all ends of his sight, he saw this green grid as clearly as his other vision would allow, before the singularity vortex collapsed, taking the entire crowd with it to the school play. Sitting now, in a formation of plastic gray chairs, his friend to his left, he noticed that the girl was missing from the right. Where had she gone? It was difficult to say. Leaning forward now, where did she go? I don't think she's interested in the material, he offered. And with that, the Joker leaned back as the wall screen was suddenly filled with a gigantic image of National Geographic's logo. After a small wait, a washed-up gray and forbidden shore came on screen. Out of it began to burrow a slither of worms, coalescing into a form that could only be a dark black hand, twisting and writhing, dying. And as it crawled away, in its place now was an apple. 
and the brief faded away to the title screen, which was the Juxtaposition and Entry into Magical Theory by National Geographic. Very well, if this was to be the subject matter, it might prove interesting indeed, after all. But the missing presence of the girl worried him a bit. And so, rising, as others undoubtedly already had, for half the room was empty, he made his way toward the back of the presentation room, where stairs to his left and right preceded a table at the end of the room with refreshments and subtle chatter among participants. The vibe was relaxed and casual, a magical study of infinite leisure. Still, still, he knew already where the girl had gone. His gaze went to the stairs to his right. Beside him, a girl with vivid pink hair gave him a wide-eyed stare and a slight smile. But he was attracted to darkness. <laughs> he wished he had time to stop and chat, but the upper floor he somehow knew was there, called and beckoned to him. Ascending. Or was it descending? He found his way into a large and mostly blank room, save for the massive conductivity tanks in the back, blue and gold and industrial colors, massive pipes going every which way into the ceiling and furrowing out into the magical pipeways of this particular plain community. And before them, sure enough, sitting in a lonely stance, Stark in the middle of the room was the girl with her dark, dark hair pulled back, hands on knees, staring straight forward at the pipes, blindfold on. She sensed his presence, stopping, feeling now, the push-away vibe that encircled this woman, performing her dark, melancholy solace. He became irritated. Driven by only a need for contrariness, perhaps. Not necessarily out of love or concern. The Joker entered the Forceway and physically struggled against the palpable pushback waves until... She came to her side at last. Looking over subtly, they both smiled a bit. Your aura is strong, he remarked. She coolly dismissed him. And so is yours. What are you doing in this construct? She was staring at the generators before him again. I'm doing something. Don't bother me. Hearing this rejection, he began to walk away. Oh, it was always the hardest thing to walk away. Going back down the stairs, he glimpsed again the pink-haired nympho who happened to be gliding by at just the right moment. And so he reached out with a knowing vibe, and they locked eyes together. Dream woman. The pain of his heart chakra murmur he could not hide. And so, after a brief moment in time, he did not attempt to. He decided. He did not wish to take hold of it, but it emanated and she caught hold of it and bound it into a tark and tight little bow around a small dark heart, pushing it toward him, blowing on it a bit, and the vibe arrived in front of him with pink magical dust floating behind. Cute, he said, smirking a bit. Drop the act, Punko, she said back. 
she was right before him now, and he didn't know what to do. So he kept walking, their paces magically going into flow and toe. Side by side, they exited the building through the double doors under the glowing blue exit sign leaving his friend to watch the screen and the dark-haired girl in denial. And together he and the dream woman entered a promenade of shrubbery that led to a large dominion of flora. A vast elliptical meridian enclosed a series of pink flowering trees. And beside the viridian lay a small path of green, short-cut grass, and then to either side a dense, dark mass of seething trees that could probably be entered into a forest, but seemed to disinvite exploration and speculation at this time with a woman in tow. Off into the distance was a large, light pink mansion. No relation to my color, of course. He actually smiled at this, loosening up a bit. Of course. But I did wonder briefly. They passed over to the meridian and began walking. And the vibe was getting a bit interesting at this point. Now... Now his heart chakra had surrendered its dark bitterness. And she had sensed this, but had remained cool and calm and polite all the way. And now her pink-white essence vibrated with a particular knowing that he was aware, that she was aware, that he was aware of this, and it was okay to simply walk and be and marinate in this for a bit. It was odd. It was strange. It was simultaneously warm. It was erotic. It was crimson orange. It was coldly fluorescent pink. It was mellow and calming to his soul, while simultaneously arousing beyond belief. And after some prompting from within, he finally allowed himself to relax for once. Good, she smiled, and it was genuine also. They reached for each other's hands, and now he saw her beauty like never before, for she was intelligent also, smarter than him, perhaps. And this he welcomed, anyway. There was a small black dot above her lip, and he wasn't sure whether that was his projection or intentional. <laughs> See? They were both smiling uncontrollably now, letting the perpetual chemistry burn and simmer a bit before contemplation. Looking into her blue fairy eyes, he saw that her gaze emanated a certain understanding. And with this preconception, he now noted that this entire setup was premeditated. And she likely knew of the events that had occurred upstairs. But that's why I'm here. It was a reassurance that this... You don't have to hold on to all this pain anymore. And with that, she squeezed his hands. And with a knowing prescience that the romance was heating up, she released them with flair and suddenly took his hand, sprinting toward the dark forest on the left. 
so fuck this. I'm taking you where you don't want to go. <laughs> she laughed a bit, and so did he, his crimson jacket flailing, fading to a dark rose burgundy. As the shade overcame of the surrounding gloom. Running forward now. He stumbled, not knowing who was in front and who was behind. A mastermind. Her presence assured him, allured him, and terrified him. Together they slowed down, naturally, surrendering to the concupiscence of a dark familiar aura surrounding a tree. Glade of mattressing and chanted dark fabric covered the swath of expanse in every direction. A dark mass of canopy and intricately fractal paradigms that only the ancient forest understood. She was a dark rose herself now. Magenta. Striding at a wears not pace, steady and unyielding, she was drawing him toward a source of power. He could see the gray lines, but he didn't know where they led. And as they entered a particular clearing in the thick trees, a sort of oval den, they turned gold. Bright yellow bindings led to the real-world manifestation of a large oaken ugly tree. Don't talk about me that way, the tree said. And they were at once drawn in with awe and circled the tree, uncertain as to whether its authentic, powerful, and grisly energy might welcome them. Would it entertain or be angry? Rippling with ancient wrinkles, the tree upward swung broadside, and beholden to the trees above, it cut a small circle of bright dark blue sunlight. They approached, and the oak rippled. In welcome, a dark gift. It bellowed in their minds. She, to her credit, tapered off to the side, letting the Joker approach the entity himself, and standing before it now. Now it shifted into a proper foreboding and personal manner. A wall of brown, deep, natural wisdom pervading into a large knot that seemed to serve as its orifice, or at least a point of focus. Even the trees have eyes, and their roots run deep. Its voice was a guttural, dark bassoon, the ages of the unbearable years of the forests, in its creaked and crooked, raspid birtles. Speak to me, child of Dayshine, of Earth. Tell me what you seek and what you wish to find in the land of the old forest. I came for... <laughs> because I was summoned. Immediately he knew this was the right wrong answer, and the tree seemed to shrug a bit, 
leaves rustling, <laughs> a laughter in its ancient language. I know what it is you seek, boy, and I know for whom you burn. You seek the destruction of fear at the end of your faith trek and descent into madness. But fear, I already sense, has abandoned you. You cling to fantasy delusion of victimhood, born of a man's true fear, his struggle, and hold back against his own self and his eternal grasp and conflict with death. the bindings of his own soul. You, I see, are growing mad with longing, young one. And you brood with the reluctant self-restraint of a mortal man. Foolish in love, be as it may, weak in your bindings of the blind god. At the mention of the blind god, a soft blue click pervaded his senses, but the tree did not even budge. The surrounding canopy of foliage rustled, rustled, this time in anxiety. Red, red, the threads were red, and all around there was a sense of foreboding knowing. But the woman herself, to her credit, did not budge. Either. The tree somehow seemed to dismiss all of this with a gesture of its branches. Fear not the blind god, young blood. Oaken and ancient, seek in my grounded belongings the comfort of an old tree's saged wisdom. You have nothing to fear, but to fear yourself. <laughs> the entire forest began to shimmer and glisten and rimble. Gliding now with the colors of color rainbows and impossible hues. The man's revelation shook the magic and tire of the surrounding area, and the woman, inching a bit closer now, was all ears, but mostly all eyes watching the man's every move circling him like a vulture, but equally moving slowly, unsure, but surely seduced and intrigued. The man held his hands to his head, and then his heart, his heart, ah, ripping the blindfold off, ah, this blind and mad agony, this self-sufficient provocation to end listless complacency, only held back by the blind clinging to the ledge of the flat world's pools and oceans, running amok and overdry over the edge into the black abyss, the turtles laughing all the way down. The tree had conjured the root of the issue. Afraid of being found out, the man had nowhere to go, nowhere left he could cover his heart. The bassoon of the tree laughed. <laughs> A deep, guttural bellows, 
that caused a magnificent wind to pass through all of the nearby forest, and all of the trees laughed and laughed and laughed with him. At last the truth was revealed by the tree. You were summoned here to meet me. I conjured your image, child, for in a time before time, you reluctantly agreed to contact me. And so, your heart has found the forest and the woman attempting to lead you to the ages of the Eternal Ones. I am one. She is surely one. What will you be? A fluttering of black crows overhead, and the entire forest became alive. It began to sway and swoon. The chattering and the cries of coyotes off in the distance. The lone wolves howled, and the full moon itself began to appear bright and shining through the open space between the branches. And the tree even itself, not unkindly, you see, hummed and ho flowing to an ancient Orphic rhythm, the beat of unmundane and sagic timbered wisdom the oracle of untime grandfather gatekeeper and so it is time take my advice seek your bountiful fortune, young blood, the gold in your soul that has brought you to the girl, or else succumb now to the cosmic antiques of this timeless realm of play and sundance, dark and covered by magic pipelines unending dissolving into the black void that is the very expanse of matter unmatter itself antimatter spun together to form my existence from before the beginning of time began the crystal building blocks the diamonds within your hand Every possibility resounds now throughout time. The opposite of atoms, the unending quanta, the... Oh, to hell with it, Dark Child. This is just an ancient forest after all. <laughs> And with this, all the trees in the forest in unison laughed, and the Joker and the girl laughed and laughed, and all was a cacophony of divine immortal laughter, not without cause. And the dark sweet perfume of her pollinated limbs and Erogid, erotic eons, old denses of trees and growing things vibed to this divine cosmic joke. And the Joker was present. Present. Now. Present. Alive more than ever. The Observer 
choosing in his primal heart of hearts to give himself over to the dark gravity of desire. And now the pink thing grabbed his wrist and they gently, reverently, but not overly, cavalcated into the ether sphere and the time-bending vortex of blue mass energy undivided, upended into a portal door of blinding white fantasy light. And they tumbled together around one another in glorious unison into a field of thick and flowing green-yellow grass and paper flowers vast around a canopy of purple mountains, eternal October-autumn trees, and a rising sun that began to form before their arrival. The grass swaying tall to the gentle and smiling wind. For all was alive in the stillness here, and the air itself gave warmth to their arrival, along with the bright peaking of the flowers now. Now, now, Looking closer now, he noticed all of these flowers were made of paper, but glowed iridescent nonetheless. Reeling now, roiling, frolicking into the buzz and faint brush of the foliage, not unkindly, they gave in to the primal pleasure of their senses and began to feel what it was to know the knowledge of naked skin. And they rolled around together in the ancient brush. Above there was no sun, but faint pink cushioned marshmallow clouds spun and weaved to the cosmic rhythm and the joker felt it may be appropriate to follow in suit jackets off naked now vulnerable in terror holding each other she ended up on top of him before spinning him. And her face was above him, her shocking, shockingly pink, or was it orange hair, was distressed now. In an Amazonian bedhead, a cascade of fire, and a red smile of delicious warmth and contentment appended her countenance. They lay there together in dizzying appraisal, eyes dreamy, gleaming together. He could feel her strong yellow sunshine, her dark light, Eyes glowing crystal blue-green oceans within Lovecraftian oceans. He was lost in her gaze for a long moment without time. But in this place, there was no time. And so, eventually even this moment faded then, as she began to gently rub her hands along his chest, spreading apart his feeble red coat, and together they felt a certain sense of peace and longing. But it did not last. The happiness gave way to a certain tragedy, and he casually allowed it to come to pass. 
What is troubling you? he asked. But afeard he might already suspect he knew the answer. And that is why he asked, the interminable waiting for her to say something just would not do. Just hit him with the truth already. I cannot stay here with you. At this he balked internally. No, it is not like that. I cannot remain here. For you are still blood and flesh, young. And we cannot reconcile this discrepancy in the time flow. <laughs> then just why not? He shouted amusedly. But inside he was darker, far darker than he appeared. Hmm, alas, no great words of wisdom or wit came to him at all. I suspect you already understand. It is not, not that I don't want to stay here with you. I want to. More than you know. And at this sea, a timeless dazzle of empathic heartache crushed all of his senses, and he knew surely she must feel it too annihilating any sense of the outside world, gazing into the dark void of his ancient distress and eternal damnation and dismay. Unless he could find a way now to remain here, to be with her, he would give anything, he would pay any cost to be with her. But alas, But alas, they were of different material, she said. Although they were meshed and molded from the same immortal fabric. But he sensed now with a ripple that the strings were pulling him back now to the real world. Oh, don't take me back to the real world. I was enjoying my flight. You think it is the strings. You blame them. But, really, what are the strings without your will to power them? A drum roll beat bashed its way through his gut as her words formed the gateway to the brown and dark oily slick black portal that drew him backward fading away from the field and from her at least she abided there a moment watching him fall fall away before she quickly got up and flew upward into the sky in a black flash and then he was too far backward into the tunnel consuming him to see the paper flower world any longer <laughs> Firmly deposited now, with a belch, irony, and melancholy, on the top of an office building, the brown tunnel that had drew him here smiled faintly, not unkindly. But the Joker had no respect for it anymore. It was not intelligent. It was blindly following orders by the blind god. And the tunnel cascaded away like a Chinese dragon, the color of shit and forever disappointment. Disappointment. The only thing one should expect to harvest in this mortal life and world and planet. But still, the rain of years passed by. Tears of rain. And those tears of all the lost and faded years, wasted. 
clouded and descended upon the urban landscape, and there was no full moon at this time. But far away, in the language of the wild, a feral howl could be heard. And no more words were necessary. Glumly, it dawned on him that this was perhaps the first time in a very long time, or was it all time, perhaps the first time ever, that he could simply casually enjoy so much spending time with a woman so without needing to give in to the carnal pleasures of sex of sex for this was something more and it fulfilled him as much as it filled him with a chaotic restless irony And he found, he found for once that he was not angry at her, for leading him on, for they both craved the same thing, eternal union, 